Welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, webinar that Britton is going to be hosting. We appreciate you joining us uh, live. This is the first time we're using the Zoom platform. Uh, so you should have some of the functionalities that you didn't have last time. Uh, we'd ask that uh, if you're not participating, if you could just please mute your microphone. Uh, there is a question and answer uh, option in uh, Zoom, and you can navigate to that uh, by using the, the chat feature, um, or you can raise your hand. Uh, Britain's got an uh, interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, presentation lined up for you today, uh, and she does have a question and answer at the end. Uh, so I won't take up more of her time. Uh, just to introduce myself, Nat Wagner uh, in the planning department, uh, supporting Britain in downtown planning, and appreciate y'all's time today. Britain, would you take it away? Thanks so much, Nat. Um, happy Monday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time, um, we do have a copy of the first presentation that I did last week um, on our web, historic.georgetown.org. Today, um, we are continuing our celebration of Preservation Month. So um, the Historic Preservation Month is an effort uh, that has its roots back in the 1970s. Uh, that it, the really the American preservation movement got started um, quite a bit before that, but uh, kind of came to the to uh, federal law in 1966, and from then uh, we've been working really hard to preserve our historic resources and to take care of our heritage at the local level. So this is every May we get to celebrate um, more than usual our historic resources. And a lot of organizations in our community are doing some really fun things this month to celebrate that. Uh, also, while we are all isolating at home um, or kind of have limited ability to, to go visit in person, there are a lot of great things online. So you can check out, I've seen a lot of activity, activity on social media. So if you're on social media, the Williamson Museum is doing a really incredible job telling stories of Georgetown and Williamson County. Um, that's there on Facebook. Uh, so that's uh, the Williamson Museum. And then also a lot of people don't know that Special Collections at Southwestern University has a Facebook page, which is really, really cool. They're pushing out some amazing content. You can't visit in person right now, but they did just post about uh, Charles Sanford Belford's trunk, which they have in their collection, and they showed pictures of Mr. Belford's trunk and tools. And Charles Belford is really notable in Georgetown for being a lumberyard owner and builder. He plays a little bit into my story today uh, that I'm going to talk about, and then he, um, he has an entire historic district. One of our four National Register historic districts in Georgetown is named after Mr. Belford. Um, so really exciting uh, things that you can visit online if you're interested if you use social media, the Williamson Museum and then special collections uh, at Southwestern University are doing some cool things. Also, um, Preservation Georgetown is another one of our local partners. They're a nonprofit that um, works to celebrate our great historic places. Um, and so you can also check out Preservation Georgetown uh, and hopefully before too long, we'll be able to meet back in person with them. So I'll get started with today's topic. What is a COA? Um, it's a, a three letter acronym that I use a lot in my work. And then when did downtown Georgetown have a hundred foot tower? Uh, one of my favorite structures, hard to call it a building, but one of my favorite structures we've ever had downtown. Uh, so the planning department is here to serve our community. We work a lot uh, in development services type of work, but that's where I'm located. So our historic preservation work is also located in the planning department. If you haven't visited us yet, we are located just west, directly west of the Georgetown Public Library. Um, can't come see us in person really yet, uh, but when we are able to be open, we'll be right there between City Hall and the library. And that's where my office is located. In the meantime, you can check out historic.georgetown.org. That's a great place uh, to start linking to our historic resources. I'll be using that a lot today. And also you can check out planning.georgetown.org if you need our contact information or need to reach the planning department at all. Other helpful websites, maps.georgetown.org for some really fun maps their GIS department produces, um, agendas.georgetown.org if you'd like information on how to find out what's going on with uh, meetings right now, the, the meetings that we are having, 
and then housing.georgetown.org if you have any housing questions or or need some more information there. And all uh, housing is doing some really cool work right now that I'll highlight a little bit later in the presentation. If you need to get a hold of me, my name is Britton Bostick. You can reach me at Britton.Bostick, B R I T I N dot B O S T I C K at Georgetown.org, or give me a call. My direct line is 512 930 3581. And I got that corrected on the slide this time. Yay! So a certificate of appropriateness. This is a really long term, which is why we use COA so frequently to talk about this. So what is a certificate of appropriateness? Um, why do we have them? Why do I really enjoy them? Uh, and, and how did that come about? So uh, when we're working in the historic districts, a lot of times we're working with historic structures, but not always. Uh, and so a certificate of appropriateness is a way for us to evaluate new projects in the historic district. So new projects in old places. And the reason we do that is because Georgetown, our community has said, hey, our historic districts are really, really important to us. These are very special places. These are places that have our ties to the past through the built form. And they're what make Georgetown so special. And Georgetown has been recognized over and over again for high quality of life, for um, being just a great unique place to live with its own identity. And a lot of that is because of our historic districts. And protecting those is really important to our community. And it's important to, uh, to uh, us to the point that we have a special process if you want to do a project in one of our two historic districts. So I talked about the historic districts last week. We have one that's our downtown district and kind of is centered around the commercial downtown area. And then we have a second historic district, which is mostly residential and that's our old town. So if you're in one of those boxes and you probably are going to need to have a certificate of appropriateness or a COA if you do a project. Now, it's not the same as getting a building permit. It may be required in addition to a building permit, but that COA means that um, you've gone through the design review process to make sure that you comply with the standards that we've set up in order to do a project in our historic district. So on the slide, I've got uh, where you can click, go to historic.georgetown.org, and then you can click in the blue box on the side, you can click Certificate of Appropriateness, COA Applications, and that'll take you to the page that is very specific to our COAs. So what does this mean? A COA, you submit an application to the planning department. It goes to me um, because I'm the historic planner, um, coolest job in the world. And so that application type comes to me and I begin to look at it and see uh, what is the project, what is the request, um, sometimes a property owner will submit their own COA. They're going to do their own project and they'll do this work themselves. Sometimes um, a contractor will submit the COA application because the contractor's doing the work and they'll put together all of the documents that are needed. Sometimes an architect will submit it. So I get these applications from different people who have different roles and projects. Um, as long as you have the property owner's consent, you can submit an application. So if you are a property owner and you want someone else to do the application for you, you can do that. And then uh, if you're the property owner, you can also do this yourself. So uh, most importantly, you'll see I've highlighted the downtown and old town design guidelines link. This is a green button uh, at the top of our pages. You can click that and it'll take you to our design guidelines. Design guidelines are the review criteria. They're what we've said, this is how we, our community, have decided we want historic buildings to be treated, and here's what we want uh, structures in our historic districts to look like. So those design guidelines are really important to read through before you do a project so you know what the expectations are, um, and they give some really good information there. If you ever have any questions, I'm not sure what this means. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Um, that's where you can contact me. Um, you can call the number, email me. Um, when we're able to be open again, you'll be able to stop in and visit me in person um, and ask any questions. My job is to help you understand how to go through the application process. Um, so it's, it's not terribly difficult, but it does have a few pieces. 
that I wanted to highlight here. So first, know the guidelines, know where to find those. You just click the green button and it'll take you to the page that shows you where those are. Uh, and then we have a couple of pieces uh, that we need also uh, when we go through this process. So we have set up this really cool map. It's one of my absolute favorite tools and, and things that I'm so excited that I get to have available to me. Most cities don't have this. So Georgetown's very special uh, in that we have this map. So the first thing that you need to do if you want to do a project for a property in the historic district is go to our historic properties map. If you go to historic.georgetown.org, just scroll down a little bit and you'll see an image of a map with some colorful dots. Click on that and it'll take you to our map. You can enter your address in the search bar up at the top left. And when you enter that address, it'll take you to that property. And if it's, a his, if it's an identified historic structure, it will have a dot on it. And those dots are color coded. Blue is low priority, green is medium priority, and red is high priority. And as I mentioned last week, low priority doesn't mean not important. It just means that it may not be quite as special. It may not uh, have as much detail or ornament, ornamentation or decoration, or it may have had a lot of alterations over time, or it may not be quite as old. We have structures that were built before 1885 that are still in existence in Georgetown. And then we also have brand new structures in our historic district. So if it's got a dot on it, that's where um, it helps us understand, is it a high, medium, or low priority structure? And then once we know that, that's what helps me to know how the review process works for your certificate of appropriateness. So about a year ago, City Council made some changes to the review criteria, and we have two different paths that an application can follow uh, when someone is requesting approval of a certificate of appropriateness. So some projects only require staff review, and that means that uh, when the application comes in, if it's something that our development code says staff is able to review this, uh, that's the HPO review, Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, if, the, if the Historic Preservation Officer is able to approve this, then staff reviews it, makes any comments, uh, communicates with the applicant, and then it doesn't have to go forward to a public hearing. If it says heart, and you'll see in the table, I'm showing on the screen that decision-making uh, body on some of these is HARC. HARC is our Historic and Architectural Review Commission. And this is a total of nine people who serve our community by reviewing applications that our development code says need to go to the commission uh, in order to be uh, decided on. And so if you are doing new building construction in either historic district, HARC reviews that design of that new building for compliance with all of the required uh, and applicable rules that they review for. So they make sure that it meets uh, the building design requirements. Um, and so uh, they kind of have uh, some high responsibility there. But other projects, uh, maybe if you're doing an addition to a low priority structure, or maybe if you're getting a new roof, or maybe if you're getting a new sign, a lot of uh, business signs in our downtown are reviewed just at the staff level and, uh, and don't go to HARC. Some go to HARC, but uh, as long as it meets the design guidelines and our development code, then it's approvable at the staff level. So two different ways uh, that applications get reviewed. One is reviewed by staff and the other goes to HARC for a decision. I get to look at all of them regardless, so um, I get to see these projects no matter what. Um, but this is how we know is that our code has a table that tells us um, how the projects get reviewed. And then there's also some exemptions. So there are a few different types of projects that don't require a certificate of appropriateness. Um, and always really good to check with me um, about that if you have any questions or aren't sure. So that is how our development code talks about it. What do you need for an application? Um, so we have three main pieces that we need. One very most important is the property owner consent form. So we have a standard sheet. I've got a link to it here on the website. You click on that blue link and it'll take you right to the form. You can just fill it out, sign it, and turn that in with your application. That's important because uh, we use that to verify that the person who is on record as being the owner of the property has actually agreed to the work that's being done. And 
even if you're the property owner, you still have to give yourself permission. So that might seem kind of silly, but it really is an important part of our review process to make sure that we have the correct approvals on file for the project to, to go forward. Second is a letter of intent. And I think a lot of people don't realize what a great opportunity this letter of intent is to tell the story of the project or to tell the story of the property. So this is where I'm looking for as much information as you can give me about your project and as much information as you have about your property. Because sometimes knowing the history of the property is really important to the kind of project that you're wanting to do. And I'm available to help with that research. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts of my job is getting to dive into uh, property history and understand what's gone on in that, in that place for uh, the past, sometimes it's just for the past couple of years and sometimes for the past 130 years or longer. Um, so if you have any information, great place to put that. And if you have photos, um, photos are really, really important because they help me understand a lot of, um, of what kind of project you're asking to do. And also uh, what's the current status of the property and what changes may have been made over time. It helps me to identify the style of building if I have current photos. So uh, anytime you can include photos, even in your letter of intent, that's really, really helpful to me. And if you have a COA that needs to go to our Historic and Architectural Review Commission for a decision, they really, really benefit from having uh, photos of the property. So that's very helpful. Other than that, depends on your property or your project type, but you might need um, some really extensive drawings to show what kind of project you're doing. Maybe you're doing a brand new building that requires uh, quite a few drawings so that we can understand what that will look like. If you're doing an addition, it might require some drawings to show what that addition will look like when it's complete and to give us a clear picture of that. Uh, and then sometimes it's as small as, um, let's say a downtown building owner wanted to change their paint colors. That's just reviewed at the staff level. And so I would just need to see uh, what is that supposed to look like at the end and, and what do those paint colors look like. Um, so some of it's more in depth and some of it's a little more simple, depends on the project. But again, that's what I'm here to help with. Uh, if you have any questions about that. And so uh, that's kind of where the basics are um, for what you need to know for an application. But also uh, really important, um, and, and it sounds really complicated, but it, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. All of the permit applications and reviews that we do in the planning department for building and inspections, if you go to get a building permit, this all goes through one website. It's called My Government Online, and you can create an account. Once you have that account created, you can apply for a permit uh, or submit an application. And so uh, if you're going to do the Certificate of Appropriateness, the COA application, it sounds like you want to click on Permits and Licensing once you have your account set up. But remember, Historic Preservation is in the Planning Department, so you want to click on Planning and Zoning to get your application started. And on our website, on um, the COA page, we have a link to uh, some helpful information uh, for, it's a step-by-step -step instruction manual for how to, how to submit that application. But again, feel free to contact us if you ever need any help. And what I wanna highlight too today, um, I really have some wonderful partners that I get to work with. So Susan Watkins is our housing coordinator for the city of Georgetown. And Susan uh, works with our home repair program, which is really excellent. Um, you do have to um, qualify, and a lot of that's based on income level, but for our, uh, for our homeowners, even in the historic districts, um, this, this applies to you. So if we've got homeowners who need some house rehabilitation and they have some repair work that needs to be done and they qualify for this program, the city, um, as long as the funds are available, we would be able to uh, potentially assist with that. And so this is a great program if you or if you know someone who uh, is needing some repairs. And this is especially helpful if you've got really high electric bills or if you've got really high water bills because there may be something going on with your house that uh, we could partner with you and help you to reduce those bills. That might be a leak that can be repaired that maybe the, the property owner wasn't aware of 
or that could be um, some extra insulation in the attic. That could be windows that have a, a better insulated value. There are a lot of options, um, but you can go to housing.georgetown.org slash home dash repair dash program and find out more information for how to qualify for that, who to contact uh, for that if you have any questions. But that is a really great program that's uh, really started to take off um, and is meeting a lot of needs uh, for our Georgetown residents. So we're really excited about that program and that uh, you're able to access that program even if you're in the historic districts. And that's a great way for Susan and I to be able to partner to assist uh, some of our community members that uh, we could serve through that program. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me about that, or you can also contact Susan in the planning department. So um, please note if you have any questions about that, I'm available during the Q&A portion. Also, you can give me a call at 512-930-3581. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss your project in detail. But I'm gonna tell a little story now, and this is about the 100 foot tall water tower um, if you're new to Georgetown or, or relatively new to Georgetown, you may not have even heard that we used to have a 100 foot tall water tower. And this is the kind of project that makes us have the certificate of appropriateness requirement today. Because if somebody came to us today and said, hey, I'm going to build this 100 foot tall tower in the downtown, we would probably say, whoa, whoa, let's talk about that first. Um, so this is one of those projects that um, this was back before we had this process. Uh, we didn't have building permits back then, and so people built uh, what they wanted to. And you might be used to seeing uh, city water towers that are pretty tall, but they weren't like this. Uh, so back in 1881, approximately, um, the city of Georgetown had been around for, oh, a little over 30 years. At that point, Georgetown started 1848, 1849. Uh, things really got kicked off, became the county seat. Um, I talked a, a bit about this last week, but um, Georgetown had come along and Georgetown had, um, this is really exciting. So on the screen, I've got on the left, a section of the Sanborn fire insurance map. And I talked about these last week where you can go to get to them. Um, but this is from the 1885 map. And it notes that the population at the time was 2,500 people. So if you can imagine, Georgetown's rapidly approaching 80,000 people today, and back then we only had 2,500 people. Uh, so it was much, much smaller. It even says that the prevailing winds for southeast uh, and north. Uh, and so really fun information when you zoom in on these maps. But what I've got highlighted here is the location of that water tower, so that we know that by 1885 the water tower was complete. This was 20 feet in diameter and 100 feet tall, which is about the biggest water tower I'm aware of before modern times. We have some pretty big water towers today because we've got a large population we have to serve, but this would have been really, really big. Um, what's so cool about this is it was built using the same construction technology as the Eiffel Tower, but it was built about four years before. So metal plates and rivets were how they constructed this tower, and it was built privately. So the city of Georgetown's waterworks started as a private company um, and that was started by um, a gentleman named MZ Taylor. Um, I'm going to move forward to the 1916 map, but if you need a reminder, the Sanborn maps are located in the University of Texas Library Collection. They're online. You can go to legacy.lib.utexas.edu slash maps, slash Sanborn, and then shortcut slash G to get to the list of Gs, or you can just Google Sanborn Insurance Maps, uh, Texas, you'll go to it. But the 1916 map shows um, a lot of information uh, and kind of the development of the fire department and city hall around this water tower. But before that, uh, Captain MZ Taylor, very, very notable uh, Georgetown resident, um, he's the man who started Georgetown's volunteer fire department. So our fire department's origins are with Mr. Taylor. Um, he built a house on East 5th Street, just north of our downtown. And the house is still there today. Um, his family still lives there. His descendants still live there. So that house has been in the same family for um, well over 100 years. And he's left a really wonderful legacy in Georgetown, which includes 
our water system. And so he was a really forward thinking man. Um, he was very business minded and he knew that Georgetown needed water service, that wells weren't going to cut it anymore. Um, and so he put together this plan and then executed it to pull water out of the San Gabriel River, run it up Main Street, and store it in this 100-foot tall water tower. And that then provided the city with water, and it provided a location for the volunteer fire department uh, to be headquartered right where that water was. And so um, they started putting the water lines in the streets. And on this map, you can see these dashed lines in the middle of the street. But if you zoom in a little bit, it tells you the size of the water lines. And there was a 10 inch water main or a 10 inch diameter pipe coming straight out of that water tower to supply the city. And if you look at 10 inch pipe, today our engineers would say, well, that's not very big um, for the, to run the entire city water off of. Now you get like 30 inch water mains or, or even more. But at the time, 10 inches could supply um, everybody in the city who got on the new water system. And so he built all that up, put that in, and then he sold it and the property that the water tower sat on uh, to the city of Georgetown and Georgetown took over the waterworks and they became a public waterworks. So the building that I am housed in, uh, the building that my office is located in is the historic light and waterworks building. So they eventually moved from this location over to, uh, over to 8th Street in MLK which is where we are today. But that's where this all got started. And so because that was the city of Georgetown's first property in the downtown that the city owned, that's where they decided to put the fire station and our city hall. And so if you go look at the Georgetown Art Center right there at the corner of Main Street and East 9th Street, it says Locust Street on this map because it used to be called Locust Street. Um, that was renamed to 9th Street. But at the corner of Main and 9th, you'll see this L-shaped building. And if you look at the ground, there's a big circle that shows where that water tower was. And you can see a historic marker that talks about that. So that's a, a really fun little trip downtown to take that you can even take right now um, because it's outside and uh, doesn't require you to go into a building. But that's the building that they built around the water tower. And they had a, kind of a plumber's office uh, and the city waterworks were located right there. And so uh, I've got some really great photos. Uh, these come from Georgetown Public Library. So I mentioned last week our library has an incredible collection of old photos of Georgetown. Uh, thankfully, I had these before uh, we had some of the closures that we've had for city facilities. The library still is open on a limited basis, um, but I haven't been able to get back over there to do research yet. I'm going to wait until everybody's able to be fully open. But when we can go, it's really great to go to the Texas room on the second floor and go look in the gray filing cabinets. There's some uh, binders in there that have great photos and these come from them. So what we're looking at, um, I don't have a date for the photo. Uh, I don't have a date for either of these photos, but we can kind of guess a timeline. The photo on the left shows the water tower and you can kind of see the ladder that went up the side. That was how you would have gotten up to the top they had apparently originally put, you can see this kind of scaffolding structure. That was where the fire bell was. And then these wood sheds. So this would have been um, probably the 1880s. It probably would have been around 1885, maybe 1886, right after this tower was completed. Because uh, they had the bell tower and they still had wooden structures. They hadn't built the new stone structure um, this could have been as late as 1890 or 1891 because we didn't get that stone city building uh, until around 1892 or 1893. But um, but this is uh, this is kind of showing from late 1880s, let's say, um, looking from the back of a building on the square. So somebody must have gotten up on a rooftop uh, and taken a photo looking south back toward uh, that water tower. And then the photo on the right we know that this was taken at least before 1910 because we're seeing the water tower in the background, but we're also seeing the fourth Williamson County Courthouse. 
And so this was a courthouse that was a uh, fourth courthouse constructed, and then it was torn down to make way for the bigger courthouse, our fifth courthouse that we have today, that was completed around 1910. Uh, and you can see some other wonderful buildings in the foreground, some of our historic homes, but then uh, that existed at the time, but then also you can see the uh, what's now the Little White Church downtown, um, where Preservation Georgetown has their offices. Um, you can see that church kind of there in the foreground. So uh, really fun look at the way things used to be. And then moving on to my next slide, um, you can see again this water tower and it's really great to see it from kind of a street level view. This is back when we had just dirt streets and so it wouldn't have been that hard to dig up the dirt street and then put the water lines in. Um, but you can see just how big and tall this tower was. Now, at some point in time, the um, Sanborn maps indicate that that tower went from 100 feet tall up to 150 feet tall. And I'm not completely sure if that was a typo or if somebody was just like really impressed by the height and estimated it taller than it was, or if they had actually extended the height of the tower. It would have been really difficult to make that tower 150 feet. There have been a lot of um, constructability issues around getting to that height with that kind of structure, um, but it's possible and it, it, we have a record of that. So if you have any information on that, if you know more than I do, please feel free to share that with me. I'm very curious to know because it looks like it, it either went back to being 100 feet or it was only ever 100 feet tall. Not really clear on that. Um, so that's where the maps get a little bit confusing. Um, but we've got some great shots showing uh, just how big that water tower was. And so like I said, today, um, at that time, they just built the water tower because that's what they needed to build. But if you wanted to do that today, um, you'd have to come see me first. <laughs> and we'd have a talk about it. And then you'd submit your application for a certificate of appropriateness. And then you'd go through uh, kind of the correct review process. And so um, I have some more photos that um, this is where it's, it's a lot of fun to see photos of the past with no people because you can see kind of clearly, but it's really fun to see with people. So these are also photos from our library. These are photos that the library's got in their collection. And I really love these. On the left, we've got a little girl and a bicycle and she looks pretty sassy, um, really. And this is um, getting ready for a parade in 1908. Georgetown has had parades since its beginning, from what I can tell, and Georgetown has always loved a parade. A lot of our historic photos in the library show parades or people getting ready for parades. And so she had decked out her bicycle, and you can see a gentleman sitting on a horse, and he is dressed like Uncle Sam. He's got striped pants and a coat with stars. He's got the big hat. Uh, riding a horse and you can see people are, are really kind of well dressed and, and ready for this parade uh, which probably was going to go up Main Street and then you can see people sitting in the windows this is so fun sitting in the windows of City Hall um, it would have been the jail on the first floor or what was called the calaboose and then City Hall was on the second floor so you can see people hanging out of windows uh, back in the day and then on the right we've got a couple of gentlemen uh, in a carriage and so this is a great view. You can see the water tower just on the left and the set of stairs that went up behind it. But this is uh, the Georgetown, the original Georgetown fire station. And so they had the gates there um, because sometimes uh, they would keep the mules in there. Um, although I've heard the mules were kind of free range mules that would come when called. I don't know if that's true or not. That's a great, uh, that's a great kind of anecdote though of the past, but they uh, kept all the fire station equipment the wagons and the hoses behind those gates. And when there was a fire, they would ring the alarm bell and then they would open the gates and then the fire trucks would roll out. And so um, these gentlemen were kind enough to pose right in front of um, our original fire station building. And that's been filled in now and serves as the art center. Uh, if you've never been to visit the Georgetown Art Center, it has um, a wonderful revolving collection of art. Um, I'm a big fan. And so make sure you stop by and check that out when you're able to do that again. Or you can always peek in the windows right now and have a look. Um, so other photos that we have are showing, um, again, this amazingly big tower that is just part of everyday Georgetown life. Um, we've got these gentlemen with a dog, uh, this very photogenic puppy. And then in the background, you can see uh, some boys kind of hanging out at the fire station door with their uh, stick and hoop. 
uh, that they would have been playing with in the street. And um, it looked like, you know, I have a feeling these boys um, probably got into a little bit of mischief every once in a while, but um, everybody loves a fire truck, right? We've always loved fire trucks. Uh, and especially kids have a real affinity for fire stations, fire trucks, and firefighters. And so it looks like that hasn't really changed over the last 100 years. We've always really appreciated our Georgetown Fire Department and what they do for us. And then on the right, um, eventually, I understand maybe around the 1920s or the 1930s, don't have a firm date on that, um, the doors were added. Um, and this is um, kind of, the building kind of uh, went through a few changes over time, so they were finally able to fit doors. And then um, over time, the fire engines ended up getting too big to fit in those bays, and they built uh, space for the fire engines right next door where Thundercloud Subs is today. That used to be where the fire trucks were, also some police cars. And then eventually that water tower um, came out of use. The, the water system for Georgetown changed. We went to other types of water towers. Uh, the next one was built over by Southwestern University. Um, you've probably seen it. Uh, and then as, as our population has grown, Georgetown's added additional water towers. So uh, ultimately this uh, was condemned for being uh, not in good shape. Uh, the maintenance hadn't been done to keep it up and it was dismantled. And what I'm gonna ask is if anybody knows the year that it was dismantled, because I don't, that's information that I haven't been able to acquire yet. I'm not sure what year we took down the water tower. I know that it was gone by 1964 because I have an aerial photo of the city of Georgetown in 1964 and it's not present in that photo. So if anybody knows, um, feel free to put that in the Q&A um, or to just kind of pipe up and, and let us know or feel free to email or me or, or call me if you've got that information because I'm really curious and I don't have, I kind of um, batches of photos from different decades, but there's a, a whole period of time kind of in the middle of kind of from the 60s to the 80s that I don't have, have um, a lot of photos available to me. And so um, if you know, that'd be really helpful. So I'll go ahead and um, open up the question and answer session. If you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer. If it's something uh, that I can't answer immediately, I'll try to get back to you next week or follow up with you. Um, but does anyone have any questions about what I've talked about or about the COA process or any other questions about Georgetown's history? So um, if you don't have any questions today, um, we will post this video. We've got the first video posted at historic.georgetown.org. Um, occasionally we're working on some web updates, so occasionally it might disappear for a short period of time. Um, just feel free to check back. Um, Preservation Georgetown has done an excellent job helping us share uh, these presentations, let people know that we're doing this. So thanks so much to Preservation Georgetown for partnering with us on celebrating um, May. Uh, and then we're hoping next year we'll be able to do another uh, in-person exciting event. But for now, um, this has been a really exciting chance to share some of Georgetown's stories with um, and that's been really fun. Britton, uh, we do have a question posted to us. Uh, the question is uh, about how many COAs do you review each year? And maybe you could share a little bit with the audience about the different types of COAs that uh, you uh, process. Oh, that's a, a really good question. Uh, so I think last year we may have broken a record. Um, we did over 80 um, COAs, I think, um, in total. And so, um, so I do a lot. I get maybe um, kind of an average month is maybe four or five new applications. And then um, a really busy month is more like 11 or 12 COA applications. And some of them are really simple. Um, so sometimes um, we'll get a new business downtown, which is always really exciting, and that new business needs a sign. And so if anytime you get a new sign and you're in the historic district, you need to go through the design review process for that. Um, and so sometimes it's um, just a really, it's a simple sign and um, it meets all of the requirements. And so um, that's a pretty quick approval process um, because it's, it's met all the, the requirements for the design guidelines, for the size, for where it's being placed, et cetera. Um, sometimes a business might want to change their paint color. So interesting to know, for uh, one and two family structures in the historic district, so if, if it's a single family home um, or a duplex, 
we don't require you to get um, a COA to change your paint color. So that's something that you can just do on your own. We don't, we don't review paint color changes if you're just like a, a single family home or a duplex. If you're a like multifamily or an apartment complex, or if you have a commercial building, that's where um, you'll need to get a COA for paint color change. And so sometimes I look at the new paint color schemes for buildings, and that's always really fun to do. Uh, and a lot of times um, we're getting, if you've seen the photos of downtown from the 1980s, everything was pretty beige. And I mean that literally, a, a lot of buildings were painted a beige or a tan color. And today um, people are, are doing some kind of more exciting uh, paint color schemes with their buildings. And so that's always really fun for me to have a look at. Sometimes people want to do a brand new building. Either that's a brand new house or they want to do um, a brand new building downtown. So um, recently uh, we've had the Watkins building come downtown. We've also had, um, there's a, if you're familiar with the, the Palace Theater, they have a new performance center that's down on 2nd Street close to El Monumento. That's in the historic district, so that needed a certificate of appropriateness. And so those are examples of new buildings, also a new house, uh, so sometimes I get to be at the very start of a project and help uh, work through that application process. Those buildings, uh, the brand new buildings, we now take to HARC, whether it's a house or a commercial structure. Um, HARC is the, uh, the review body for that. So I spend quite a bit of time making sure I have all the information that we need and can get a staff report and a presentation ready uh, to provide that information to the commissioners to make a decision. And that's, um, that's a really fun process. I have um, uh, a background in architecture. Um, and so it's always really fun to be able to see the drawings that people do. Um, and there's a lot of interest in our historic district. So I stay pretty busy um, with, um, sometimes people wanna make a, a change to their house. Maybe they wanna add on to it, or maybe they wanna um, make some modifications to the roof. Maybe they've got windows that are not working very well and, and trying to figure out what their options are. Or sometimes um, if you have a building with wood siding, that wood, um, if it's not really well maintained, um, it's gotta stay painted, it's, uh, you wanna keep it from water and insect damage, but um, sometimes people might buy a property um, that has some damage already and they're trying to figure out what to do. And so um, there are quite a bit of repair work types that you wouldn't need a COA for. Um, if it's gonna look exactly the same, be the same material, all of that, um, you might not need a COA for that. Always good to check with me, but uh, sometimes people need extensive repairs or um, to be able to, to make some changes there and before they're able to do that, before they can get a building permit for that, um, they need to go through the COA process. And that's where I have the opportunity to say, okay, does what you're proposing meet the, our, our, our development code, our UDC, <laughs> planners use a lot of acronyms, right? So UDC is Unified Development Code, that's the city's development code. So I look at that and then I also look at our design guidelines and a few other review criteria. And it really is a great opportunity for me to help people um, understand their historic properties better. Sometimes I have information that a new owner might not know, and it's always really helpful when I'm able to share that as part of the process. And so um, it just helps make sure that people have the tools and resources that they need to be great stewards of our historic buildings. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any um, kind of unusual uh, or really exciting cases. Um, sometimes we do get demolition requests. Um, and so because we have historic districts, it's really easy to um, think that all structures are historic, um, but they're not. They're, they're a range of ages from, like I said, the 1880s or maybe even a little before all the way to today. And so sometimes um, we have some structures that maybe haven't been very well maintained and they've got a lot of problems and uh, the property owner wants to request a demolition. Um, any demolitions in the historic district are reviewed by our historic commission. And then if you have a historic structure that's outside, oh, this is where, this is the one instance that you would need to get a COA if you're outside the historic district. Um, if you go to get a demo permit, one of the things that they'll check for is to see, are you an identified historic structure? And we have historic structures that are outside of our historic districts. And so if you have a medium or high priority 
structure outside of a historic district, you still have to, uh, rec you have to go through the COA application process if you want to request a demolition. And so um, even if you're outside of the historic districts, it doesn't mean that you're not required to have any kind of review for demo. You, st you'll, you still do have to have that review. You don't have to be reviewed for design compliance, but for demolitions, we do take a very careful look uh, at what's being proposed. Um, if someone uh, says that this is a building that's not able to continue with us. So, um, so those are kind of, um, usually if we have a demolition request, um, that's where um, I do quite a bit of research and try to understand what the history of that structure is um, and where, uh, what its condition is today. And we go through kind of a two-step process for that. Um, so it's a little more extensive, but um, We've had a lot of projects because we have a lot of interest in Georgetown and a lot of people, um, like I said at the start, people really love Georgetown um, and they're really excited about being here. And a lot of that is because they really value our historic districts and are excited to live in a community that has such beautiful historic buildings, um, both our homes and our commercial buildings. Um, and so that keeps me pretty busy, making sure that people have the information they need. Uh, and then I also get to do um, a little bit of work just with what we call um, kind of normal, normal planning projects. Um, but for the most part, um, it's with the COA process is the majority of my work. Um, and it helps me to, to really have the opportunity to interact with our community a lot. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of my job. Any more questions? Um, if you if you think of something later, uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm glad to be available. Um, or if you know someone who wants to do a project and they're not sure where to get started, um, I'm available to help. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll kind of be back in normal business uh, here shortly. But until then, you can reach me by email. Um, if it's easier, you can always just email historic at georgetown.org. That'll get to me. And then you can also call 512-930-3581. That's my direct line. And, uh, and if I'm not able to answer the phone immediately, um, I'll get back to you really quickly. Britton, one more question came in uh, regarding the tower. Uh, JC Johnson said that the city painted the tower black during World War II to make sure that Japanese wouldn't bomb it. Uh, that's excellent uh, insight. We appreciate uh, you sharing that with us, uh, Larry, and for uh, the community conversations and keeping the narrative alive in the community uh, and appreciate Mr. Johnson's input. Uh, Britton, you have anything you want to share about that? Uh, so that's true. Um, that is very true. There was a lot of concern during World War II. Um, now, we know that, that um, Texas ended up being too far inland um, to be very much at risk, but there was, um, there was such a concern about, um, even here in the center of the U.S., there was such concern about um, really visible buildings and so much of Europe had been bombed. Um, and then uh, Hawaii uh, was, was bombed by um, the Japanese military. And so there was real concern that um, about targets uh, during the war. And so the thought was if they painted the, the water tower black, it would make it hard to see at night and therefore make it like less of a visible target. And so um, that was Georgetown's uh, kind of most um, notable uh, kind of effort during that time period to try to make themselves less visible um, and less of a visible target. And so um, that's a really, that's a really great story. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, we, like I said, we know now that um, that wasn't something that happened, but um, people took that, people took that really seriously. And then uh, kind of to follow up on that, um, you may see if you ever look on the, I believe it's the east side of the courthouse, you may see a radiation <laughs> symbol. <laughs> the basement of our Williamson County Courthouse was designated as a bomb shelter during um, kind of the Cold War era. And so our downtown actually does have some of those connections to uh, wartime efforts uh, and concerns. Um, and so you can kind of see some of the, a little, a little bit of a memory left there um, sometimes. But um, really great point. I'm really glad that you brought that up. But that's a good part of that story. Uh, thank you all for attending and uh, for par your participation. We, we uh, appreciate the uh, community stories that you're all sharing with us. Uh, we hope that you can join us next Monday at noon. Uh, Britain's going to be bringing out some pro tips for historic property research. 
and also share a little bit of background on the first known female real estate developer in Georgetown. Looking forward to that. If you have any stories uh, from the community regarding early real estate uh, tycoons or moguls, like uh, the first female real estate, we look, we appreciate you sharing those with us. Uh, as Britton mentioned, uh, we're trying to keep uh, historic.georgetown.org website up to date, and uh, we'll be posting the webinar information there. Uh, so please check that out. It's also got a whole host of resources, as Britton mentioned. Britton, uh, I think with that, that uh, is no more Q&A unless anybody else wants to add anything to that. Um, anything else you want to share? Closing remarks, Britton? Great. Um, I'm really excited about next week. Uh, next week, I'm telling a story that I've wanted to tell for a long time um, that I began doing research on. Um, well, I was researching a property a couple of years ago and kind of stumbled upon this information uh, and finally um, it made a little to have enough information to share. So um, I hope y'all will enjoy that. But um, if you have any questions in the meantime, again, just please feel free to let me know or, uh, or if you have a question you want me to answer during next week's uh, webinar, then uh, please let me know. We'll be happy to do that. And I guess just to note, the last one of the month will actually be on Tuesday at noon. Uh, the last Monday, the 25th is Memorial Day. Um, we'll, we'll be off for the day, but we'll come back on Tuesday. Uh, and then hopefully, hopefully I'm expecting um, I'll have a guest. So please continue to join us for the rest of uh, Mondays in May or the Tuesday in May at the end uh, as we bring you more information and celebrate um, Georgetown's wonderful history. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, please stay tuned at historic.georgetown.org. We look forward to seeing you next week.